Welcome, uh, Senior Minister of State for Law and Health, Mr. Edwin Tong, Senior Counsel, Justice Belinda Ang, Chairperson of the Singapore Mediation Centre, Judges of the Supreme Court, Professor Lily Kong, President of the Singapore Management University, Mr. Philip Fong, Managing Partner of Evershed's Harry Elias LLP, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, Good evening. I'm Banjin Yen, the Executive Director of the Singapore Mediation Centre. And on behalf of the organisers, Evershed's Harry Elias LLP, the Singapore Mediation Centre and the Singapore Management University, I would like to welcome all of you to the 8th Singapore Mediation Lecture. I would also like to thank Evershed's Harry Elias LLP for their generous sponsorship of the Singapore Mediation Lecture Series which has become a key event in the mediation calendar and the August audience here is testimony to this. We are privileged to have Mr. Edwin Tong SC, Senior Minister of State, Ministry of Law and Ministry of Health as our distinguished speaker this evening. As the Senior Minister of State in the Ministry of Law, Mr. Tong has focused on the promotion and development of Singapore's legal sector and dispute resolution services. He also handles various wide-ranging aspects of law reform, including intellectual property, corporate restructuring and insolvency, as well as legal aid and access to justice. Admitted to the Singapore Bar in 1995, Mr. Tong was made partner at Allen & Gladhill in 2000 and later appointed senior counsel. At Allen & Gladhill, he was concurrently head of the restructuring and corporate insolvency department, co-head of the litigation and dispute resolution department, and also a member of the firm's ex goal. Mr. Tong was a leading lawyer at the Singapore Bar. He has been consistently cited and recommended for his expertise in dispute resolution and as a restructuring and insolvency practitioner in various leading legal publications. So let us put our hands together to welcome SMS. SMS, please. Thank you very much, Junet. Justice Belinda Ang, Chairperson of the Singapore Mediation Centre, Judges of the Supreme Court, Professor Lily Kong, President of Singapore Management University, SMU. Mr. Philip Fong, Managing Partner of Evershed's Harry Elias. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, I will literally, if you look at the title, it's a voyage across the world of mediation, across the different countries and so on. And I'm taking the title quite seriously and quite literally as well, as you will see. So what I'm going to do is, again, following the title, to focus on what we have done in the past, to give some light as to where we are now, how we see the landscape, and then look at where we think the key drivers of mediation should be. And, and the broad theme of what I'm going to say would be, we have had a significant milestone in having the mediation convention signed in Singapore. It's something I will cover. Uh, but it will be very foolish to rest on those laurels. We, in typical Singapore fashion, need to find the next bound, the next step forward, and I think we need to look at the drivers of mediation around the world to tell us what then we should focus on. This lecture has been an annual one since 2012, and it's a very useful platform to bring the legal community together to discuss relevant germane issues that arise in the context of the mediation landscape. And I want to thank in particular Justice Belinda Ang, SMC Chairperson, for inviting me here to speak some months ago. Judge has been an active advocate for the use of mediation to increase, to increase access to justice, to give options, to look at mediation as a way in which parties can continue to preserve the relationship, maintain the harmony, even as they might come across a dispute. Under her leadership, SMC has professionalized domestic mediation and has certainly handled a steadily increasing caseload over the years, contributing richly to the practice of mediation in Singapore. 2019, as I mentioned earlier, has indeed been a momentous, if not historic year for mediation. We are very proud to have hosted, if you look at the image on the screen, the historic signing of the Singapore Convention on Mediation on the 7th of August, and I know many of you were there. 70 countries attended, which itself is testament to the support that we had, not just for the practice of mediation, but I would dare say for the support of Singapore as a trusted platform, trusted legal system, 
one that people believe in and have confidence in, and I'm, and I'm prepared to bring the disputes here for Singapore to resolve. 46 countries signed up to the mediation. We, when we started the convention, we asked the UN, how many do we need to make this a convention? They said three. I said, okay, we can do that. <laughs> Just one ourselves and two others. And so we went out, I mean, our staff went out, we made it a concerted effort within the government. Every time any office holder traveled, we made it a point to put it on the agenda to remind people about not just the fact that it is a Singapore Convention on Mediation, which of course is important, but because mediation is actually the way in which businesses would like to see the business disputes resolved. And I would suggest that as we make my way through this lecture, that much of the support that the countries have showed us is really a reflection of their own business community, how their own business people see the value of mediation within their own countries. And I would suggest that that has what led to the overwhelming support that we had for the mediation convention. So 46 countries of the 70 signed up to it. And actually there was one more who literally as prime minister was walking into the hall to get it signed. We were trying to check whether or not the instruments of authority was in was valid or not, and it, it turned out to be not. So actually, it could have been 47, but it was 46. But I'm pleased to say, nonetheless, that since the convention took place in August, five more had come on board. So we are now at 51, and we believe that that's a, I mean, it's a very encouraging start, very strong start, given that it's only been nine months since end of last year that the UN General Assembly had passed the resolution to adopt the convention and to allow Singapore to host it and of course, to allow Singapore to name the convention as well. If you look at the comparable convention, the New York Convention, which all of you are sure are familiar with, of course, in a very different time and different place and perhaps different circumstances, but it started with 10 signatories when it first opened for signature. So the comparison, I think, is not just a recognition of where we are, but I think of the importance of mediation in today's overall dispute resolution landscape. The UN Treaty being named after Singapore, I'll say a little bit more about it later, but I'll just share one anecdote with you um, in the context of the lead up to the signing of the convention and getting it done. So back in 2017, negotiations in the UN were very intense and we had a team up there, uh, almost permanently stationed there to deal with the negotiations, to bring the parties together. And then there was a very harsh North American blizzard, shut down the whole UN headquarters snow everywhere, nobody could move around. Delegates that were involved in the negotiations for the purposes of getting the convention done were all stuck either in the hotels or elsewhere and just could not access the meeting rooms at the UN HQ. So they decided to find an alternative venue. Uh, till now they refuse to tell me where it is, but I'm convinced in some bar somewhere. <laughs> snow and storm notwithstanding. And with the blizzard, once they got in, they couldn't get out. And uh, they didn't get out until they found consensus on what the convention looked like. And so this is where we are today. So even in those early days, there was a hallmark of the good qualities of a mediation, or rather qualities of a good mediation. You had an unanticipated scenario, and then you had an innovative solution. You, want, you needed to get everyone together to find a solution, and you locked them up. So in the end, what started off uh, in this fashion ultimately ended up with the convention. These anecdotes tell us a little bit about what happened, but I think tell us a little bit more about the confidence that many other countries have in us. And that's not something that we should take lightly. It's a value that we have as a Singapore brand. The confidence in the system, confidence in our first class judiciary, our top level bar, and of course, the whole legal industry ecosystem as well. It's been hard work to get the negotiations done. We're very happy that it is done. But as I mentioned right at the start, we now sit perhaps at a point of inflection. Having done it, having put it in motion and have a very good start, we are now, of course, embarking on ratification as, as we are persuading other countries as well. We also only need three to ratify for it to be effective. I think we can achieve that. But the key is, how do we now move forward? How do we not keep on referring to August 2019 and say we've done this? 
how do we make sure that we can leverage on the goodwill we have generated, the thought leadership that we have shown in this space, and how do we make sure that mediation not just becomes something that is commonplace, as common as litigation and arbitration, but also a way in which we can help businesses resolve their disputes. So I look at it from the perspective of the past, what we have done in the developmental process, the present, where we are today in the legal landscape, and perhaps most importantly, have a glance at the future and see where that might take us by looking at the trends. We, people say you look at the past to tell the future. It's true to some extent. But also importantly, how the legal industry can work together, how the different facets of mediation, the different institutions, the different leaders of mediation in our community all can come together. So let me start with the past. Mediation actually is not something that is new. It might have been a relatively new concept in terms of it being the, the, the third of the triumvirate of uh, dispute resolution mechanisms, but it's certainly not new, especially in our deep, rich Asian context. Migrants from South China used to resolve commercial and non-commercial disputes through negotiations with their clans. In fact, many of them still do today. They go to a clan elder, one who is respected, one who is able to speak to both parties in a neutral, impartial way to find the common ground and to find a way to resolve the disputes. Still being done today, but it started in those days. The Malay communities in turn had their own village head. And likewise, the Indian communities had community leaders called panchayats, if I pronounce it correctly, who played the same role as well, in whether it is in context of a Hindu, Hindu community or in the Hindu temples. These were all people who were respected. And today we just call them by a different name. They are mediators. On an institutional level, our efforts to reintroduce mediation as an alternative dispute resolution mechanism started in the 1990s. And those of you who were practicing litigation then would know, I, I, I was a young litigator then, came out of school, went into practice, wanted to resolve everything by fighting, because that's what we were taught to do in litigation. And then we went to pre-trial conference and the judge kept asking us, have you had mediation done? Have you tried to settle this case? And it was, of course, uh, anathema to, you know, to someone like me who didn't have much experience. But I think looking back now, I think that those days when we started it by institutionalizing mediation in the context of, obviously, litigation. Mediation doesn't exist in vacuum. It exists when there's a dispute. So it's a natural place to start. But apart from that, I think mediation was also useful from a societal setting. If you look at Singapore, we are densely populated. We live in a city-state. Neighbours are close to each other. We have a community, a society that is multicultural, multi-religious. We have different backgrounds. We respect our religions in different ways. And there could be significant flashpoints if we don't have a way in which we can resolve and find a way to resolve and preserve the harmony in our society. But coming back to the point I made earlier about institutionalizing mediation in the context of litigation and disputes, one of the early boosts we had was really the support from the judiciary and how mediation was integrated into the domestic dispute resolution system from the early days. It was part of the system. It was something that was triggered every time we had a PDC to resolve the disputes. And in fact, it became institutionalized in pre-trial conferences and formalized in 1996 where parties were encouraged, uh, some more forcibly than others, to resolve it by negotiations. And then, of course, in 94, the court-based mediation in the state courts, the, or what is known as court annex mediation, in 94 started. And that, again, gave a, a tremendous boost to mediation in the context of, of dispute resolution and litigation. Government also played its part, and looking at the Landscape in 96 convened a committee on alternative dispute resolution, looking at the different means by which disputes could be resolved and how it could be implemented, promoted and implemented beyond just in the court setting. And these recommendations came very quickly. In 97, the Singapore Mediation Centre was set up. So it's 22 years now, today. And very quickly, a year after that, the Community Mediation Centre started to operate. The CMC started off as really a grassroots-led initiative where grassroots leaders within communities would be 
called upon from time to time to resolve disputes. And CMC gave them a platform, a setting, and as well as the training. And so actually the early mediators were grassroots leaders. And we just celebrated uh, this 21st anniversary of the CMC last weekend. And we were looking at mediators who have grown up through the system, with the system, with CMC. And uh, I think they will go far because there's some, so much value in having community mediators sit amongst us, sit within our community and resolve those disputes. But so 97 was the SMC, 98 was the CMC. SMC has grown from strength to strength, as I mentioned earlier. It's handled many cases referred by the Supreme Court. As you know, there was a track by which SMC would be called upon and parties went there. More than 4,000 cases were referred to the SMC, providing high quality mediation services with a very good and deep bench of quality mediators. So they achieved a high settlement rate of 70% and more than 90% of cases were settled within one working day. I, th I think there's a bit of a stretch as to what exactly is one working day. <laughs> it can go well beyond 6 p.m. And uh, there was one mediation. I always tell the story about George. We were there from the morning and we were very far apart. And eventually, because he had so much energy uh, and he outlasted both myself and my co, my opposite counsel, that we staggered out of the office at 4 a.m. in the morning with a signed agreement. And we, were, we felt that we had really achieved something. Actually, it was him, him just outlasting us. <laughs> so different skill sets as a mediator. You need to coax, cajole. You need to find that one a common ground in the midst of so much conflict and antagonism to build a bridge across. And of course, you need staying power, literally. But that, I think, has lent to the progressive and very successful early settlement rates of the SMC, which in turn then helped to save court resources. And as you know, in the 1990s, that was particularly essential when we were, we were looking at preserving our status, enhancing it even, making sure that our court system was able to deliver justice quickly, efficiently. I think the role that SMC played in the context of that cannot be underestimated. On top of that, SMC also raised awareness of mediation. So it's not just about when you get into court and when you have lawyers being encouraged to go to SMC, but also going out to the community, the business people, explaining what mediation is all about, explaining the value of mediation and the benefits that it can have. Not all cases can be mediated, I think we all know, but those that can would benefit from it. So SMC, went out, mediation lecture was one example of how this has started to bring awareness to the ground, to engage in exchange of ideas, and also, of course, promotion of mediation and the thought leadership behind mediation. Beyond domestic mediation, we then went on to develop international commercial mediation. So we took it one level beyond that and tried to look, looked at how we can harness the learning that we had. If you remember, SIAC at that time was developing as well into the international center that it is today. How the transition took place from a domestic arbitration to an international one were lessons that we also took on in the context of mediation. At that point in time, late 1990s, early 2000s, there was a rise in cross-border commercial activities and transactions. Parties needed fair, efficient, transparent way, quick as well to resolve disputes, helping business partnerships, supporting trade and commerce, and ultimately preserving the harmony and the relationship. That's, I think, the true value of mediation. Uh, many of you who have heard me speak earlier on mediation know that I, one of the things I firmly believe in in mediation is the novelty of the solution that can be found. You can go outside of the legal boundaries. If you went and litigated a matter or brought a, brought a case for reference to an arbitration, you know that you're constrained by certain rules, including rules that govern what kind of remedies you can get. And the solutions cannot be flexible because that's, it's governed by law and legal principles. Whereas in mediation, you can find very innovative solutions. What may be a problem arising from a sale of goods could actually be fixed by buying even more of the goods, if you know what I mean. And that is the kind of solution that can be found in mediation. The other value of mediation, of course, is in preserving the harmony and relationship. And that's not to be underestimated. 
because today's contracts are large, huge contracts that last a long time, sometimes even beyond the lifespan of a single management team. So goodwill that has been built up over so many years should not be so easily lost over one dispute. And that's a theme that keeps recurring. And later on, when I talk to you about the infrastructure dispute resolution protocol, that's the thinking behind a, an initiative like that. But let me just give some case study examples just to illustrate the point very quickly. There's a dispute between a Korean party and an American party, but it was a joint venture where the Korean party was a minority shareholder running the business, and the parties accused each other of breaching terms of the shareholders' agreement and so on, the, the usual. Parties then decided to go for mediation at the recommendation of their lawyers, and it was held in Seoul. This is an SIMC case, so mediator went to Seoul. And at the mediation, parties were very entrenched in the position until the mediator then explained that as shareholders, whatever is the outcome of this arbitration, this dispute, you will remain as shareholders. At this point in time, it's not a oppression suit, not a buyout. You're going to get remedies either for damages, for breach of this joint venture term or that and so on. But the end result is that you remain as shareholders. In the end, Americans decided to buy out the shares of the Korean party and to ensure that they were, they were able to preserve the harmony, the payment was staggered and so on. But one key ask from the Korean side was after selling out, they wanted to ensure. And I think it's also part of the way in which the Koreans like to, to do their business. They wanted to make sure that the staff was not let go of that they continued to retain and had a job. And that became a term of the mediation, that the Americans buying over the, the Koreans would retain the staff for X period. And I think that eventually was the term that brought them over the barrier. And it's something that was, of course, as I explained just now, not something that you can find in a typical commercial arbitration where you can't impose those terms on another party. Another example, there was a global technology company that was sued for IP infringement, alleging that the infringer had sold stolen copies of the products by the tech company. The matter was brought before the courts, parties agreed to mediate, and the matter was settled in somewhat an interesting way. The alleged infringer, who said, actually, it's not me, there was a whole bunch of other people producing the same stuff, then agreed to help the, uh, the IP owner to go and track down the bigger fish upstream. And call it a plea bargain or whatever you, you call it, it helped to solve the matter between those two parties. Maybe it created another dispute down the, downstream, but that's a story for a different day. But my point behind all this is that you can find solutions that don't sit within a normal rubric of a legal claim or legal principles. Along with the development of SMC and the internationalization, we then set up three complementary entities. They are in my view, key institutions that have brought mediation to where they are today, and they play a role and will continue to play a role in developing mediation. And they are the SIMC, obviously, providing not just good administrative services, but I think taking a leap out of what was done at SIAC to ensure that the panel of mediators who sat, who sat at SIMC would be the best that anyone can find in the world not to be selfish about it and to be guarded and to be parochial and say it's SIMC so it has to be Singapore mediators. That's not the case and that was the principle that SIMC operated on to make sure that we don't compromise on quality. SIMI, Singapore International Mediation Institute, was set up at around the same time as a professional self-regulatory body to set standards and provide accreditation for mediators. Again, an important part of the ecosystem, much as you want to develop the business side of mediation to ensure more cases, to develop the expertise, I think we have to make sure that the capability of mediators, competency, and the ability to always be ahead of the curve, knowledge-wise, is preserved. And SIMI plays that role. Finally, the Singapore International Dispute Resolution Academy, SIDRA. It drives academically, academically robust thought leadership research and complements Singapore's suite of dispute resolution services and training, so an academy that helps to oversee international dispute resolution. All that was 
the landscape that has taken us into where we are today. And I would say that on top of everything else that I've said, we are also fortunate as being Singapore, being located where we are, at the hub of transshipment, at the centre of commerce between the East, the West, and perhaps also leveraging on our social political position, stability, to offer services that perhaps no other country in this part of the world can offer. And I think it is in that context that mediation services has also developed. A trusted legal system undergirded by neutrality and a strong commitment to the rule of law, of which an offering of different types of dispute resolution services, of which mediation was fast becoming and certainly now is entrenched as one of the key pillars. We also had progressive and relevant legislative framework to adapt to the needs of businesses. So, for instance, in 2017, we enacted the Mediation Act to enhance the enforceability of mediated settlement agreements. So even before the Mediation Convention for domestic mediation, we already had a framework to ensure that mediated agreements could become enforceable under the Mediation Act. And as you know, that's one of the real values of the Convention on Mediation to provide the parties on a cross-border basis the ability to go to one mechanism and say, if I've signed up to a mediation, this is my enforcement mechanism. We have also built on the success of Maxwell Chambers, first built 2009, I think it was, nine or 10 years ago, and two months ago, we launched or opened up Maxwell Chambers Suites, which provides now three times the size in terms of facilities for hearings and so on. But more than just housing physical locations for hearings and facilities, which of course is very nice, it also provides a hub for so many world-leading institutions. SIAC is there. Permanent Court of Arbitration, PCA is there. IAA is there. Oh, sorry, I ICC is there. AAA is there. Insol recently became the newest tenant in there. All of this, I think, creates an ecosystem of thought leadership, of dispute resolution, ecosystem that plays off each other. And I think that was, the, that was the purpose behind giving some space to ensure that offices locate here, we bring the best of the world's organizations here, so that this continues to thrive, not just as a center for dispute resolution, but also as we progress into the next bound. These are the people who will help us with it. In the five years since SIMC was established, they've looked at, they've had over 80 cases to date, settlement rate as of end of 2018 was at over 80%, which is significantly above the global settlement rate of 70%. And it has expanded its footprint through many international collaborations as well, signing MOUs with foreign dispute resolution institutions in countries like China, India, Japan, South Korea. Three of these four countries eventually signed up to the convention. We are also developing new products and services, or at least prior to the SCM, it was very popular for the up met up protocol to be adopted. And I think you all know the up met up It was an arbitration, but you have a mediation in between. You settle it, you come back into the arbitration to record a settlement as an award. It needed to be done in the days pre-convention because you wanted to then leverage on the New York Convention for the arbitration award for it to be enforceable. But of course, today with the SCM, we don't need to have a separate route into the New York Convention. There's also the SIDP, I mentioned that earlier, Singapore Infrastructure Dispute Management Protocol for infrastructure projects that was introduced last year. And it has a couple of novel features. The thinking behind this is that if you look at all, by all accounts, infrastructure spend is going up in Asia. Money is coming into Asia in particular, also in Southeast Asia, for investments to build roads, to build transport services, airports. These infrastructure projects tend to be long-term, and they tend to be large-scale, high-value. And we wanted to make sure that these projects would have the best chance of succeeding, even if there might have been a dispute arising at some stage in the project. So the SIDP protocol takes a proactive dispute resolution mechanism. So it tries to resolve a dispute or be there to resolve the dispute even before the dispute has arisen. So a disputes board is appointed from the start of the project at the inception so that the personnel involved in the protocol 
will be familiar with the project, will know the people involved in the project, and will be able to handle very quickly any sparks that may arise, any conflicts that may threaten to derail the project. The protocol also provides a wider range of methods, including mediation, so it, SIDP also works with SIMC, in, or rendering an opinion, or making formal determination, or neutral evaluation. So it's fairly flexible, but the novelty behind the idea is to situate a body that helps the parties find conciliation, even as the dispute arises. On a global stage, we've been recognized for our thought leadership, and I mentioned just now our role at Ancitral. We had to bring consensus across so many different uh, thoughts, thinking, legal systems, and of course, different interests. And I thought what we'll do is also to give me a break, we'll play a short video to <laughs> showcase the mediation convention. It gives me great pleasure to announce that the Singapore Convention on Mediation, to be signed shortly, will be the first UN treaty to have an orchid named after it. Very nice indeed, isn't it? Very... That deserves a round of applause, doesn't it? <laughs> Secretary General of the United Nations, I declare open for signature the United Nations Convention on International Settlement Agreements Resulting from Mediation to be known as the Singapore Convention on Mediation. For those of you who were there, I think you know how proud we were at that moment. Everyone coming together, the whole legal community coming together, and so many ambassadors we had, goodwill ambassadors. And the whole event was uh, also helmed by so many youth ambassadors who were so proud of their own country. But as I said at the start, I think all that is now in the past. We now have to find a way to move forward to bring this to fruition and to really leverage on what we have done in the Singapore Convention on Mediation. And so, let me offer a few suggestions. First, we must look at what are the drivers of growth and the opportunities which present themselves. Where in the sphere of mediation, in the context of dispute resolution, can we play a bigger role? And I will suggest that it is not just in terms of the subject matter, which, are, which you'll hear from me are infrastructure type projects and investor state projects, but also the geographical location where that can be done, where we can look at expanding beyond the boundaries of Singapore. We must ride decisively on these riders of growth and take the opportunities. So as I mentioned earlier, investments will flow increasingly into Asia, especially with the Chinese renewed initiative on BRI. If you look at ASEAN's GDP, Today, ASEAN's GDP alone stands at about US $3 trillion, and it grows at about annually, collectively at ASEAN's level, at about 5% annually. If you contrast that to the annual growth rate of GDP around the world, everyone else is at 3.8%. So it tells us that the ASEAN focus, the Asian focus, is going to be strong in the coming years, in the next 5, 10, 15 years. To do this, we must strengthen our mediation network across the region, and if not the region, also globally. We cannot be content to say, let's just deal with mediation in Singapore. And I'll offer you a few suggestions as to what we can do. We must also embrace future legal trends and how we, what kind of cases we think mediation might apply to in the future. So let me elaborate on these, starting with a survey that was done by SIDRA, a recent survey. If you 
not sure you can see it clearly, but the recent survey is quite extensive. Surveyed 300 corporates and external counsel on the use of dispute resolution mechanisms between 2016 and 2018, so in the period before SCM. It showed that arbitration remained the most common, commonly used dispute resolution mechanism, followed by the third bar is the international commercial litigation. So SIAC first, SICC next. Not surprising because this is pre-SCM days. Key reason behind it was the ability to enforce outcomes. Arbitral awards were obviously easier to enforce, had more confidence, and of course there's a track record of using the New York Convention over time. Hence, the lack of a mechanism for cross-border enforcement of mediated settlement agreements was a huge limitation. And I venture to suggest, if you just look at these, this additional slide here, is that beyond, beyond, media, beyond the original slide where you showed that arbitration and litigation was preferred, the reason for that is enforceability. Today, with SCM, I think we should expect there to be a different outcome. So if enforceability is, was the inhibitor with SCM, we think that would change. Why? Because I think we all know if a business gets into a disagreement, you want to mediate it, you have an agreement, you want to know that it can be enforced, especially if your counterparty comes from a different country. So with time, I think that trend will reverse. On top of that, if you look at the adoption by countries, I mentioned that we had started with 46, now it's at 51. We are also putting together the necessary legislation to ratify it as uh, other countries. But what I think is also key would be the adoption by the corporates and the businesses. I mentioned earlier that I think the significant support by the countries coming forward to sign it is really a surrogate marker for the, their own country's business interests. So if you, have, if you are sitting in China or India and you want to do business with the US, maybe not now but in the future, you want to make sure that if you have a dispute, you can mediate it and it will be enforceable. And I think that's the value system behind it. So that, over time, with enforcement not being an issue, I think will change. Second, another driver of the adoption of mediation, as I said, is economic growth. And let me just give you some statistics to outline the point. Asia is now the fastest growing region. I think that you turn to any paper, any news report, you will see that. It's home to 28% of the world's middle class, which will increase to two-thirds by 2030. So not long from now, 10, 10 years or so. And significantly, 70% by 2050. So in other words, 70% of the world's middle class is projected to be in Asia by 2050. So not only is that a large number, it's a significantly sharp ascent over the next two decades, two to three decades. Second, urbanization rate currently is at 48%. It'll increase to 55% by 2030 and 62% by 2050. I mentioned infrastructure demands, especially in ASEAN, is ex estimated to be about 1.7 trillion US dollars per year, each year from 2016 to 2030. That's the infrastructural demand in ASEAN per year. On legal services between 2017 and 2020, the annual growth rate of legal services in the Asia Pacific is expected to be about 6.6%. That number has to be contrasted with the expected global expansion of legal services, which stands at 3.4%. So the expansion of legal services, the growth of legal services in Asia Pacific is estimated to be almost double of that you will find around the world. And I take legal services to be a surrogate marker for business activity. The more business activity there is, the more you expect legal services to be on the rise. And then we have the elephant in the room, China and India, two large economies. China is the world's largest economy, contributing around 30% of the global growth in the past eight years. India, already the third largest economy in terms of purchasing parity terms and has a strong momentum of growth. And then we have two other, two other giants in Asia, South Korea and Japan. South, Korea, South Korean and Japanese companies have, are on the international scale. 
They make significant infrastructure investment in Southeast Asia. So if you take a step back and look at the signatories to the SCM, you have the two largest economies of the world, you have three of the four largest economies in Asia, and half of ASEAN, five countries out of the 10 in ASEAN, signed up to it. As I said, I think I, I read this as a marker of activity, business activity within those countries, and their interest in using mediation as a way to resolve disputes. But I would go a little bit further and look at regions, not your typical regions, and look at Central Asia. So I visited Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan earlier this year. Kazakhstan, I'm happy to say we managed to persuade them to sign up to the SCM, whilst Uzbekistan felt they were not ready yet, but they attended the convention to show their support. And I believe that the demand for dispute resolution services in this, these regions will only grow as the economies mature, as more investments go in, as more infrastructure work takes place, they will only grow. Overlaying all of that is what I said at the outset, that mediation is a culture that is, is, a, is a value that is very much embedded in the Asian way of doing business. And not only is this something that we hear firsthand, sometimes anecdotally, sometimes through your own dealings in these jurisdictions, but if you look at a SIDRA survey, we do a lot by survey, as you can see, at least they, they help to affirm or support findings. We can't rely on this alone, but they help to give us a different sensing. But on this SIDRA survey, of all the reasons for selecting uh, dispute resolution and why you want to achieve hybrid mechanisms, which is mediation arbitration, preservation of business relationship is a top reason for users who choose the hybrid dispute resolution such as the art met up over the standard arbitration. So if you have standalone arbitration, you can't quite achieve the preservation of relationship. And so all of these factors taken together tell us that in the region, there'll be a growth of influx of investments coming in, economies will grow, infrastructure spend will grow, along with it, business activity, and along with that, legal, the need for legal services. And the objective of re resolving those disputes will, if this plays out, put preservation of relationship between the parties as a top priority. So a confluence of all these factors, I think, help us to decide where the next bound in terms of growing mediation should be. So with this, we looked at the different outreach. So let's start with BRI. It's, it's a very bold project. Whether it fails, whether it succeeds, we don't quite know yet, but it spans 60 jurisdictions, it's long-term, it's on infrastructure, and it's on massive investments. They will need a reliable dispute resolution mechanism to find, to ensure that the investors who bring the money inside, put the investments in these projects, know that it is safe. So over time, we have been engaging with the Chinese market, Chinese officials and our counterparts in China to see whether we can come up with a common platform to help to resolve those, those disagreements. And so I was in Chongqing earlier this week on the Joint Council for Bilateral Cooperation, the JCBC. The JCBC is the highest level of government-to-government -government collaboration that we have with the Chinese. And we put legal and judicial cooperation very high on the agenda. And you may know that our two respective chief justices have an annual roundtable every year. We take turns to host, one year them, one year us. And we reach consensus on significant matters. Our two ministries also, in very close collaboration, we did a joint dispute resolutions conference for the first time in Beijing earlier this year, and it went out very well. We collaborated with CCPIT, and now, second installment, we are going to be hosting it in Singapore sometime next year. So this closeness of relationship, I think, is something that we are building on to give ourselves and our stakeholders a platform to operate on. And later this year, we are also going to be signing an MOU between our two law ministries to further deepen that collaboration on many fronts, dispute resolution, legal aid, rule of law issues, and so on. But the one takeaway that I had as we visit our counterparts in China, and we brought several lawyers along with us as well, is that they, their own sense is that the current, the current dispute resolution mechanism that they are subjected to, every time 
a Western corporate tries to invest in China is that it's too Western-centric. It's all based on AAA rules or ICC rules and so on. Not that it's bad, but they don't feel that it is customized to what they might need. Second, they always tell us, is there also room for resolving disputes? Mediation ranks high on the agenda. And it is actually not fortuitous that the Chinese signed up to the SCM within the first wave. I think they really see value in this, and they really see value in having mediation as a way in which it preserves the long-term relationship. And certainly it embodies their own values and the values in which they see business being done. Whether that works when it comes to the US-China discussions, I don't know, but certainly in terms of commercial matters and giving ourselves a platform, I think it helps. So we've been to China, we've also been to Japan. I, I, I just wanted to show you a photograph of, uh, which I found very interesting. When I was in Japan, they told me that they set up a mediation center uh, in a temple. So this is Kodaiji Temple. And when, the, when we were brought in, the first thing they served us was nice tea in a very serene setting. So, I mean, it's something to learn as well. It's a different setting and you know, maybe outside of the office setting, it creates a sense of vibe a conciliatory, peaceful surrounding, something we can perhaps learn from. Not that we have these old temples to spare. But again, my, my sense of the market is that they're ready for mediation. I think they were not able to get uh, their own formalities together. So I expect them to sign soon, not, not in the first wave, but soon. And I think it's also a way of doing business in Japan, a culture and a value that is very consistent with mediation. We were also in India to see whether we could test the market there and see w w what positivities there would be. And SIMC has been very progressive. They, they went to India in Bangalore in, earlier this year, way before it was known that India would sign up to the SCM, and certainly before we knew that we, had, we would achieve the three that we needed to get it to, to, to be ratified. But they went to Bangalore and they took in 21 Indian specialist mediators, trained them, accredited them, and they became so accredited specialist members of the SIMC. They are now effectively our ambassadors for mediation in India. They are top lawyers, some of them are ex-judges, and they now sing praises of SIMC, and they bring this to their own practice they insert SIMC clauses into the way in which they draft their agreements as lawyers. And again, I think anecdotally and using a few points to illustrate the issue to you, I think again, there is scope for us. So across the, large, the three large countries, the three large economies in Asia and Central Asia. Beyond the geographical space, as mediation grows and evolves, what else can we do? I would say we look at the next piece, which is technology. Technology is something that sometimes lawyers are just too afraid of. I, mean, I, I for one, am not so afraid with technology. I, I'll confess to the judges that each time I go to court, there's a screen at where the counsel's desk is. The first thing you do is to fold the screen down and use it as a shelf to put your books and papers. And I think the judges also do the same thing. But, but I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, quirky story, but really one that tells us that I think we have to be prepared to embrace AI and technology. Many firms are doing it. You know all the experiments. You pit uh, AI machine with uh, experienced lawyers as uh, law geeks has done and shows that AI is able to vet a document more accurately and more quickly than the lawyers can. So there are some things that can be done complementarily with lawyers, not replace lawyers, but they can certainly be helpful. And I think Platforms such as online hearings, negotiations, automated negotiations in the context of mediation, even analytics for the appointment of mediators and arbitrators, or even counsel, would be useful. So again, let me share some SIDRA results with you on technology tools. So we had a survey done, uh, and it basically tells us that, as this heading suggests, that the use of AI and technology in mediation is still relatively young and nascent, and really we could do more. So the survey listed a few examples of technology tools uh, that were used commonly and asked if us users found them useful or never heard of before. And I think we had one-third say 
useful, suggesting that the other two-thirds probably never heard of it before. So we can learn from this and I think leverage on technology, use it to develop the practice. A closer look at the respondent profile, which is also interesting, shows that corporate users are more likely to recognize specific technology as useful as compared to lawyers. And I think that reinforces the point I made earlier. And it suggests that there's an opportunity for lawyers to consider greater use of technology in mediation and also meeting and bridging client expectations. Another new growth area for mediation is in the context of investor state arbitrations and disputes. As you know, there has been a growth, if you just study this landscape, exit arbitrations over the last decade or so, there's been a growing number of investor state disputes. As of 2018, there were 942 known treaty-based investor state dispute settlement cases. 71 new arbitrations were initiated in 2018 alone. And Again, also validated by our own SIDRA surveys, at least uh, suggestive of it, almost half of the lawyers who responded had been involved in an investor state or multilateral investment dispute from 2016 to 2018. So it's, it reinforces what we think, what we hear on the ground, and what we see anecdotally. Arbitration is commonly used in investor state disputes. Again, I think you see it in the survey, but again, I think you know. But we see a rising interest in investor state mediation. And I think that was the surprising find from these results. You would have imagined that you know, two parties, especially two states, would become a lot more entrenched. But I think the converse is probably true, that investor state disputes, even with investments being appropriated and so on, they look at mediation as something that presents a quick option, cheaper, quicker, and perhaps preserves a long-term relationship. And I think for the investor in a country, there's tremendous value in that. So we see mediation as being more frequently incorporated into investment treaties, often as a preliminary step to arbitration. O obviously, it's a preliminary step to a dispute resolution mechanism because, as I said just now, you can't have mediation exist in vacuum. It sits together with a more conventional, typical way of resolving disputes. So the Ener Energy Charter Conference endorsed a guide on investment mediation, investment mediation, and many institutions have adopted bespoke rules for investor state mediation, for example, IBA and also ICC, focusing, focusing on the skills and qualifications of investment mediators. So there's a specialist group of investment mediators now being trained, familiar with this area of the law and understanding the dynamics of parties behind an investor state uh, dispute. So for example, the International Mediation Institute, the IMI, has published a set of competency criteria for investor state mediators. Again, these are all anecdotal examples, one from here, one from here, and so on, but I think it gives us a sense of the landscape. And I'm citing this to you, not so much for you to rush off and develop your own set of criteria and so on, but to let you know that this is where I think I see the direction moving towards. And those of you who are involved in investor state kind of work, arbitrations, cross-border work, I think there is an avenue for us. Overlay that with what I've said earlier about investments coming to Asia, and I think we have some key drivers that we can lean on. Some other interesting findings from the survey. In terms of selecting a dispute resolution mechanism for investor state disputes, the top three factors were enforceability, impartiality, and political sensitivity. And I think mediation ticks all these boxes. Ad hoc mediation was more frequently used compared to institutional mediation, and only 27% of corporate users indicated that they were very satisfied or somewhat satisfied with the enforcement of outcomes. Bear in mind, this is up to 2018, before SCM. So a gap that we think SCM can fill, and the mediation community as well. So in closing, let me just quickly summarize what lies ahead. You, you heard what I said about the investments coming in. I think there is increasing globalization. This trend of ignoring or marginalizing multilateralism, I think, will, will not continue for too long. We need to competency build, we need to build our capabilities, ensure that SIMI, SIMC, SIDRA, the Academy, all come together, work together. And you can be assured that all of this will be undergirded by a progressive legal system that will react to business needs, that will make changes when it's necessary, and that changes, if needed, will come quickly. Because 
You've seen the experience of how we've done other pieces of legislation. If we need to move on something, we need to fill a lacuna, will we move quickly. But ultimately, I think what requires for us to do is to, is to call on all the different players in the mediation community to come together, to work together. I think that is an important part of this puzzle, that we are not seen as a country that has set up the SCM, signed it, and then we cannot get our act together internally. So what to me is important is that internally, we are cohesive, we pull in the same direction, and find opportunities in the region, if not in the global world. Very happy to hear views later on. I think I've said enough. I'd like to hear from you how you think we can advance the mediation, but certainly it's been a pleasure speaking to you and addressing you. Thank you very much.